Hello and welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are doing a folk tale from Himachal Pradesh. It's a story featuring an evil stepmother, her seven not so evil stepdaughters, a tiger who's a bit of a picky eater, a king who couldn't care less whom he marries, and finally, revenge. The story begins several centuries ago in a little village in Himachal Pradesh. Himachal Pradesh is a state in northern India which is famous for its association with you guessed it the Himalayas. Behrahem was a simple man who lived just outside the village. That alone should tell you that Behrahem was not very well off property in the center of the village was obviously much more expensive than in the outskirts on top of his limited assets behrahem had major expenses he had seven more mouths to feed in his home seven daughters from his marriage with his wife the youngest was sahasi and you'll see later why she's the only one of the daughters i bothered naming behrahem's wife had recently passed away which made matters incredibly complicated for behrahem he had never learned so much as to boil water the only thing he knew how to do was to sprawl out on the couch sipping a jaljeera while staring at a blank space on the wall where a television might seem appropriate centuries later Behrahem was poor and friendless but he wasn't short of advice now because this advice came from the panchayat which was the five person governing body of the village it meant that at least five people stood by that advice that was more consensus than Behrahem had ever experienced before the village panchayat advised him to do what had worked so well for everyone in similar situations marry again of course that would give him the freedom to go back to sprawling on the couch while his new wife could deal with the children and with all the household chores no prizes for guessing that the panchayat was made entirely of men but where will i find such a wife behrahem asked the internet hasn't been invented yet and i'm too poor to afford a newspaper to look through the classifieds the sarpanch who was the chief of the panchayat said that he could loan behrahem his newspaper for free there's a startup idea said behrahem a government sponsored way of loaning out reading material to interested citizens for free i call this clever idea a library the sarpanch's reaction was not quite what behrahem was hoping for that's not clever that's silly dude if you didn't waste all your time in thinking up impractical schemes you might actually make a living he scolded behrahem Behrahem looked through the classifieds he shortlisted them down to two the first said father of simple spiritual caring girl seeks any age boy for whom she can cook and clean solid experience as governess and cook and has a diploma in fetching well water loves pets and the dogs are a free bonus with the dowry that seemed to tick all the boxes but there was a catch dogs 
Behrahem couldn't stand them. That's why he was leaning towards the second candidate. Her description was brief and it read, Diane seeks replacement husband. Last one accidentally fell into the oven. Loves deserts and children for dinner. Cannot stand dogs. Pets are okay. Perahem thought for a while and decided that Diane was the one for him. Sure, she didn't mention anything about cooking or cleaning or well water fetching. And she could certainly use some help with her diction. She should have said she loved having children over for dinner. Maybe she omitted the word to economize, given how expensive these classifieds ads must be. Sure, those were all cons, but on the positive side, she disliked dogs. And the children would stand a reasonable chance of being okay if she loved children. Behrahem's situation was a little bit like a poor man's version of Captain Von Trapp, if you watch the Sound of Music movie. But all hopes of Diane teaching his girls how to sing Do Re Mi were dashed pretty much the moment the newly married couple entered their home. Diane started by assigning the girls one set of chores after another. Like a true manager, Kind of like the pointy-haired boss from Dilbert, she was sure to take credit for all of their work. And soon, just like the pointy-haired boss might have done, Diane started blaming the daughters for everything. If the Shrikhand was just a little too sugary, or if one of the girls took just a few extra seconds in fetching water from the well, or if they didn't take care of her pet bats exactly right. Her reaction wasn't just verbally directed towards the sisters. She also poisoned Behrahem's mind. Every day and every night, Diane complained to her husband about what a pain it was to manage the girls. Did he have any empathy, any understanding of what she had to deal with? Once, Behrahem tried to sneak in a word, edgewise, that objectively, she was just commanding the girls, wasn't she? The girls were the worker bees, and Diane didn't actually cook or clean anything herself. That was the only time he ever brought that up. Because when he did, Diane turned her fury on him. Didn't he know how much harder it was to be a manager? than an ordinary worker? It's the conductor of an orchestra that deserves all the credit. Did Behrahem realize how many thought cycles she had to burn to think of something for the girls to do next? Finally, the conversation took on a darker tone when Diane suddenly said, what if they had one less mouth to feed? Wouldn't that make their finances easier? Behrahem agreed that yes, their expenses would be cut by a ninth, or almost 11%, not including the bats. Now imagine, persisted Diane, what if we have seven less mouths to feed? Don't take this the wrong way. I know you love your kids and all, but imagine, just imagine for a second, that it was just the two of us we'd practically jump up the socio-economic ladder, even with the pittance you're earning. Yeah, Behrahem said, you're technically correct. Diane handed him a book and said, here's my personal copy of a German fairy tale that you might find interesting. It's called Hansel and Gretel. Read about what happens to these kids and consider if something similar might befall our children, purely by accident. Wouldn't that have its advantages? This is all purely hypothetical, of course. Diane went on to cite examples from history. Didn't Dasharat send his own sons and his daughter-in-law into exile? Didn't Harishchandra practically murder his own family? 
and not just Indian mythology. These stories are all over other cultures too. Perahem tried to say that that wasn't exactly what had happened with Dasharath and Harishchandra, but he was asked to stop interrupting. Dain went out. She said she needed some air. It's funny how she took a broomstick with her. Was she going to sweep the forest floor at this time of night? But Behrahem didn't ask her. He sat and read the book all night. He read it over and over. If you haven't read the story yourself, here's a quick synopsis. Hansel and Gretel are brother and sister. Their parents are under intense economic pressure. So mom and dad hit upon a plan. Dad abandons the kids in the middle of the dark forest. They try to find their way out. And in doing so, come across a hut made of desserts and candies and such. But it really was a witch's home. The witch tried to eat the children and got all prepared to do so. Before Gretel tricked the witch by shoving her into the oven. But then, that last part in Diane's copy was torn out. In anger, it felt like. Instead, there was a handwritten note on the back cover that said, And so, the witch ate Hansel and Gretel. She baked a lot more cookies and cake to repair all the damage to her home that those pesky little kids had done. And then, she lived happily ever after. Behrahem thought he could read between the lines. He thought he understood exactly what Diane wanted him to do. Diane wanted him to abandon his children in the middle of the forest, which was totally the wrong conclusion to jump to. Diane only wanted to eat the girls up. Perahem's mind did not go back to all the other signs he had seen, starting with a missing word in the classified ad, and all the collectibles he kept finding, which were things Diane had kept from other children she had dined on. Even her bullock cart's bumper sticker said, Children should be seen, not heard. That bumper sticker was meant as an admonition to fellow witches on table manners. It was not directed towards children's behavior. The very next morning, Perahem took his seven unsuspecting daughters and took them into the dark forest. He told them they were going to gather some fruits and berries, which he was sure grew someplace remote they had never been before and not to worry about rumours of wild beasts roaming in this very forest. Those were just lies and rumours spread by the fruit and berry sellers who wanted to dominate the fruit and berry market. Perahem and his daughters walked for hours and hours, until finally the girls complained about how they were too tired to move, and thirsty too. Perahem said that he would go fetch them some water. One or two daughters offered to go with him. The suggestion almost made him jump. He chuckled nervously and said that, Oh, guess what? It was bad luck to fetch water in a forest if you were a woman. All those of you who are not women can come with me. Oh, no one? All right. I guess I'll have to go all alone. Superstition was an effective tool for a parent to justify practically anything. And in the absence of Google searches to verify and debunk any such ideas, the girls accepted this fact, just like they had accepted everything else in their lives. Just sit tight right here under this massive tree with the freshly killed deer nearby. Don't worry, the tiger won't come back for its kill. That was just a myth, so Behrahem said. The girls were scared, but they trusted their father, and so they waited. 
and waited and waited. But he did not come back, at least not immediately. When Diane discovered how wrongly he had interpreted her Hansel and Gretel instructions, she went with Bayraham to fetch them, so she could at least have seven more meals. But when they got there, there wasn't anything left. There was a tiger that had a pretty swollen belly. He was stretched out like a pussycat, lazily, after what was definitely a long meal. The tiger didn't even mind Bayraham's and Diane's presence. He didn't want to kill them. He was already too full of humans. Please, no more. I'm full. If you do want to be eaten, I can refer you to a tiger friend of mine. He lives over by the hill. And here's a referral bonus code you can give him. So him and I can both earn some rewards. No, no, you got us wrong. We are looking for our daughters. Bayraham and Diane corrected. Your daughters? Well, you're too late. I already ate them. All of them? Diane asked, shocked. Didn't leave me even a bite? That's an odd way to talk about your own children. But yeah, I ate them. I must compliment you. They were all very tasty. Say, do you think I can have your address in case you have any more children? They were all so yummy. Well, not all of them. I didn't eat the one who smelled like roses. I'm allergic to roses. She ran over there. He pointed in one direction and then paused. Or maybe it was over there. Or there. Who knows? He dozed off, back into sleep. Sahasi was the one who had escaped her sister's grisly fate. In reality, she didn't know that the tiger was allergic to her rose perfume. As she and her sisters had sat there under the tree waiting for their father, the tiger had pounced on the lot of them. It gobbled up her sisters, but did not chase Sahasi. Sahasi stumbled through the forest, jumping over this and that. She didn't care about alerting any other wild beasts in the forest. The clear and present danger was the tiger that may or may not be chasing her from behind. It's fortunate that she thought that way, because the racket she made actually scared away a few other lions and bears. And those other lions and bears were not allergic to rose perfume. Sasi might not have run into any other wild animals, but she did stumble into a horse. The surprised horse was a royal horse, and therefore more than a little offended by Sasi's clumsiness. It neighed loudly in protest and reared up on its hind legs so much so that the king who sat on its back almost fell off. The king got down and calmed his horse with promises of a bonus bag of oats when they got back. He had been on a hunt, but now he found something a lot more interesting than just chasing down defenseless deer for sport. He was curious what this girl was doing, all by herself in the middle of such a dark forest. And why was she dressed in these strange clothes? They looked like regular clothes, but there was something different about them. They had some decorations that almost looked like mud, and the clothes had fashionable rips and cuts in various places. It's obvious that the king had never seen a poor person up close before. Sasi explained her story to the king as they rode back to his palace, how she had only come to the forest with her father and her sisters to pick fruits and berries, how her father had gone to fetch water and probably gotten lost or maybe killed by other beasts, how a mean tiger had attacked them 
by the time they reached the palace, the king had made up his mind. Sasi would be his new queen. It didn't matter that she wasn't a princess. He was the ruler of the land, and he made all the rules. If he decided that a girl of unknown origin would become queen, everyone else would just have to comply. Sasi didn't mind marrying, but she needed some kind of closure on her whole family situation. Did any of her sisters survive? What about Bethlehem and Dian? So the king launched a new taxpayer-funded project to find the tiger, to teach it how to speak Sanskrit, and then to learn the fate of her sisters. They called it Project Tiger. That's ridiculous," Sasi said. "I know the exact location of my parents' home. We can just go there." or even just mail them a letter but because she was a woman the patriarchy did not even consider her idea they captured the tiger after a long and painful search a few dozen people lost their lives and they ended up endangering an entire species by killing all the tigers that were definitely not the ones sahasi had encountered But hey, they found the tiger in the end. There were promotions all around for everyone. And they didn't even have to teach the tiger Sanskrit. It said that it had been previously captured in another kingdom in similar circumstances. And the people of that kingdom had already taught it to speak. He could even read and write to some degree. So then the tiger told them what they wanted to know the sisters were all dead sorry it said to sasi if i had known how much you cared and how much your mother cared about it i would have definitely spared you a girl each you monster said sasi but the tiger went on that's a normal reaction if i'm being honest Your mother reacted oddly. She said she had been saving you all up for a big feast and was angry that I hadn't left her any scraps. Sasi was taken aback. She knew her stepmother was mean, but she didn't realize until now that she was evil. Revenge. That is what she wanted. Revenge on the tiger and on her evil stepmother. It was easy with the tiger. She just sent him to a circus. That was slow torture. He could see all the food around him, but they would all gloat at him as he was confined in a tiny cage where he could barely even stretch. The evil stepmother needed a different kind of handling. But first, Sasi needed to establish political superiority and so sasi and the king were married in a great big ceremony all the kings and queens of all nearby kingdoms were invited normally it would have been customary to invite the parents of the bride too but that did not happen naturally the presence of a cannibalistic stepmother and a merciless father would not add to the joy of the wedding festivities but sasi had a plan she soon wrote an elaborate letter she sealed it in an envelope with a couple of gold coins she also asked a messenger to hand deliver it the weight of the envelope itself would have tempted the underpaid postal worker delivering it if she sent it by regular post Bethlehem and Dian were shocked at receiving such a rich and ornate letter hand delivered by no less than a messenger of the king himself. Why this king's messenger likely earned more in a day than Bethlehem and Dian did in an entire month. 
the messenger was upset at the assignment. Understandably, because during his other assignments, which were typically to other kings and queens, he got tipped horses, camels, and all kinds of jewelry. He expected and got nothing from Dian and Betahem. All he got from Sahasi was a second-hand four-horse chariot. Anyway, back to the parents. The letter was very cordial. It told them that she was sorry to have been separated from them. Yeah, she had riches and all kinds of great food to eat and servants at her beck and call. But hey, family is family, am I right? So anyway, she fondly remembered their time together and would love to see them both. Could they please come visit her? She was sending some gold to cover the cost of the journey. She knew it cost about two copper coins, but the palace didn't stock copper coins. So she sent them gold instead. And don't worry if the conductor on the cross forest bullock cart service did not have change for the gold coins. They could let him keep the change and she could always give them plenty more gold when they arrived. Diane wasn't sure if this was a trap. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. So she picked a compromise solution by sending only Berahem to the palace. Berahem had a great time. He was treated like royalty. He had every kind of luxury and comfort at the palace. To the point that after a while, Sasi had to provide several hints about how he must be missing Diane, how excellent the cross forest bullock cart service was, and all that, and other such hints, before Berehem reluctantly said that he would go back home. Sasi sent lots of presents. She could afford all that now. There was lots of gold sweets and loads of good food and even some servants to help remodel their home and to help make their lives comfortable. But all the gold, the sweets, the food, the servants were simply misdirection. There was one other package Sasi sent. It was specially wrapped. Sasi strictly warned her father not to open it himself. It was meant for Diane and Diane only. Diane must open it when she's alone. Though on second thoughts, Sasi added that it didn't matter if he was with her. She did not explain that those second thoughts were because she remembered how he had a pretty major role to play in her sister's death. Perehem got home without incident. He went back to sitting on his couch and staring at the blank wall. But this time, the couch was a fancy one, with cup holders and inbuilt massages. Dian looked at all the presents and looked at Berahem's significant weight increase and concluded that it hadn't been a trap after all. Sahasi must genuinely believe that Diane and Berahem were blameless. And Sasi's letter and all those presents meant that she was ready to be taken advantage of again. Diane was totally ready to take advantage of her stepdaughter's gullibility. She must go and visit Sasi. But for now, she would have to be happy with this very nice-looking box that Sasi had picked for her. The box was heavy as well. She opened it and froze. Out of the box came an assortment of the deadliest creatures known to the royal zoologists. Sazi had asked them to assemble the angriest of snakes and scorpions. It was a miracle that inside the box, these creatures hadn't attacked and killed each other. Dian did not last more than a few minutes. She had a painful end, just like Sahasi had planned. That's the end of the story. 
A lot of themes in the story are things we have seen before. Evil stepmothers are practically a staple ingredient in most folklore. For example, we've seen one before in episode 71, which was another folktale from Himachal Pradesh. We met an evil stepmother who convinces her husband to abandon his daughters in the dark forest. Though that story began in a similar way, it completely diverged past that point. The theme of an evil stepmother trying to eliminate her stepdaughter is another we have seen in episode 170. We've also seen a similar plot in episode 65, where the evil stepmother tried to profit from her stepdaughter becoming queen, but through some drastic violence, as opposed to simply hoping for a handout, which happened in today's story. As is usual on the show, the characters are named for the roles they play. Not exactly, because Diane means witch, and the evil stepmother in the original story wasn't a witch, professionally speaking. But calling someone Diane implies malignant intent, which the stepmother in today's story certainly had. Perehem means heartless, and that's an appropriate name for the father. He readily put his seven daughters in danger on his wife's instructions. Sahasi means courageous, as you might have guessed. That's all for now. Next week, it's time for a Tenali Raman story. It's been over a year since we last did one. So I figured we could cover a couple of stories of this jester in Krishna Devaraya's court. We'll see why it's a bad idea to say something patronizing to the king. And if you end up in this situation, Raman has some advice for you on how to escape exile and even execution. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.